This is the Strike Mesh Boil Podcast, presented by the Merrimack Valley Homebrew Club. This week, we rant about cold IPA, judge a Rice Krispie lager, and get to chat with our founder, Mr. Matt Savage. Welcome back to Strike Mash Boil. I'm Marco, president of Merrimack Valley Homebrew Club, and I'm joined by my co-host, Phil. We've got a great show this week. The founder of the Merrimack Valley Homebrew Club, Matt Savage, is here. He's going to tell us how he started our club, uh, and he's also going to judge a beer, which is a Rice crispy Lager. Uh, so that'll be a hoot. And joining us for the show this week, we've got Nick and Tim. Tim is new to the show. Welcome, guys. Uh, and since this is Tim's first time on the show, we'll run through our quick fire questions. And it just dawned on me the other day, Marco, we've never asked Nick any of these questions. So I think Shame. Nick, you're up. Shame. I know, I know. Shame. So uh, Nick and Tim, uh, we will uh, have you run through the questions. So uh, let's get started. So Tim, you'll go first in answering and then Nick. So first up, what's your favorite beer style? <clears throat> I have kind of a dichotomy me there, uh, if that's a word, which it usually is, just not the way I sound it, said it. But uh, <laughs> so I, I mainly like to drink West Coast IPAs. I say it's my, you know, I, it's a, a beer I just, I like straight out. So, but as far as beer that I'm trying to learn to make well are more German lagers. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. All right, Nick. I think it's almost a cliche at this point for a club. Uh, everyone says lagers, because that's sort of what we're all sort of focused on nowadays. But mine is mine is German Pilsner. That's my favorite. It's the best beer I've ever brewed, and I can't get enough of them. All right. What is your least favorite beer style, Tim? Uh, well, that would be barley wine, actually. And what, interestingly, when I first joined the club, I think the club pretty much only brewed barley wines at that point. So uh, every <laughs> club meeting was a lot of barley wines and made it really def- difficult to get home. But uh, yeah, that's... That, that's because the first meeting that Tim went to was at Joe's house. It Mr. Was. Mr. Lactose and his barley wines. Yes. Mm-hmm. All right, Nick, least favorite? Probably an American wheat. I just find it very boring. I feel like the wheat kind of neutralizes any kind of the barley flavor and just sort of tastes like nothing. And I'm, I'm talking about American wheat, which is uh, an American strain, not a classic German Hefeweizen. That's totally different. But American wheat, I just find boring and really hard to build upon. What is your favorite beer ingredient, Tim? Oh, uh, well, yeah, it's kind of a, a duh, but um, hops, you know, I, I find hops, well, first of all, when you're getting ready to you get your brew day going, just stick in your nose in that uh, that jar of hops you're about to add is the highlight of the day. I think they're super interesting. I mean, they, they add so many different components to the beer. So you got bitterness, aroma, when you add them, how long, temperatures, I mean, never mind like biotransformation and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, I dig the hops. All right, Nick. Again, I think this is another answer that someone gave before, but Pilsner malt. There are many different types of Pilsner malt. They're all sort of different. They're all very interesting. I realize this is supposed to be a quick fire, so I apologize for That's dragging okay. this on a little bit. <laughs> yeah. That's me. My fault. No, you're, you guys are good. What is your least favorite beer ingredient? Well, going along with the barley wine, I'd say, well, maybe not necessarily, but uh, like bourbon-soaked oak chips or otherwise. Not a big on bourbon-y kinds of beers. So. Okay. Nick? Fucking lactose. <laughs> <laughs> we uh Marco gave that same answer in a recent show so uh all right what piece of brewing equipment could you never live without well given that, that i'm you know trying to get some reasonable uh competency on on loggers i would say uh fermentation temperature control so cooling the glycol chiller and my my heat blanket and being able to nail fermentation temperatures is I'd say pretty important for me nick uh related to tim thermometer okay uh what piece of brewing equipment do you think is most overrated uh i'm not sure i necessarily have an answer for that um I know some of the the hop filters maybe that uh like post fermenter hot filters tend to clog and stuff. So I, I get frustrated with those condensing lid. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, uh, I used to own a refractometer for whatever reason. I can never get the readings to jive up with the hydrometer. And this is before fermentation. So that, that was an issue. And I, I sold that thing within a week. Uh, I just thought is, uh, I, I see it's, it's use. I see it's point, but I just, 
I, I find the hydrometer much more reliable. What is your dream piece of brewing equipment if money is not a factor? Uh, you know, my next piece of brewing equipment will be a barn, actually. So That's I have, a new well, answer. I, I have, love I, it. I have brewing equipment, so I, I feel actually pretty good with what I have to brew with. It's where I'm brewing that's going to make all the difference. So I want a barn that's a tap room and a nice, comfortable space to spread out. All right. What are the squatting rules in Littleton, Mass? Because <laughs> I, I may be living in that barn. We're buying a, bar, a farm and a barn, so everybody will be over. All right, Nick, top the barn. Uh, I can't, so I won't even try. <laughs> I think, I mean, for me, I mean, again, a very generic answer, either like a three-vessel Herm system or maybe a conical. I don't know. The, the issue is I like brewing five-gallon batches, and I don't really see myself ever upgrading to a, a higher volume. So, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty happy with what I have now. Okay. What beer topic, subject, style do you wish would just go away? I would say CBD beers. I mean... Oh. I'm not sure what it's bringing to the table. When I looked it up, all I could see was that they it helps you go to sleep, and that's usually not why I'm opening a beer. So I don't know. Okay, I don't get it, Nick. Yeah, I, I don't know. I kind of want to change my answer about my least favorite beer style. So the one just sprung into my mind that I wish would go away. Uh, it's the, the the milkshake IPAs. I just I find the combination just absolutely disgusting, awful, uh, waste of time. But if it was still three years ago, four years ago, I'd say brewed IPA again. That's almost, that's gone now. So one of those two. Okay. What is your desert island beer? Um, you know, I can't buy it locally, but I would say Russian River's Blind Pig. I oh, could, that's a uh, great I could drink, one. drink pretty regularly. So yeah, I would dig that. Better than Pliny the Elder. It is, I think. All right, Nick, you're up. Man, that's really hard. Desert Island. I would probably go with probably the beer that got me into craft beer, which is um, Wienstoffner Hefeweiss. Okay. Classic. All right. When you aren't in the mood for a beer, what is your go-to cocktail? Uh, you know, I have to blame my my brother who lives on the West Coast for my current uh, tiki drink craze. So totally, totally into the tikis. Yeah. I, no, yeah. Literally, like when we did this with Phil, he said his was the tiki thing, and I was like, "What the fuck is a tiki drink? Like, what is that? Like, is it pineapple juice How and do you rum?" Not know? <laughs> I didn't realize that, that that there was a category called tiki drinks, and that's what my ties fit into. I I had no idea. Yeah, but the key is making them right and with yeah. good ingredients, just like when you're brewing beer. So that makes all the difference. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. All right, Nick, what's your favorite go-to cocktail? I have a lot. Just to follow up on Marco, I mean, there was a cocktail revolution like five to ten years ago where everything is very and the tiki culture is the same thing where they're using fresh juices and really high quality ingredients. For me, I I I, I really like kind of the the new age classics so naked and famous or penicillin Ooh. are really good really good cocktails I, I really enjoy the the bright flavors and the complexity in those okay well there's the round table well no not the round table that no, was the quick not fire. The round table. that was the quick fire. add that to the blooper reel yeah yeah all right we've got a little bit of a rant and our rant is going to be on something uh, rather topical and relevant. Uh, an article got posted in our uh, private Facebook group, and coincidentally, almost the same day, I got a text from a, a brewing uh, group that I'm I'm friends with uh, about the same thing. It's called and hold your hold your butts, cold IPA. So this was in the Washington Beer blog on February 11th. A new style of IPA. A couple breweries, Wayfinder Beer and Ecalyptic Brewing, uh, have come up with this crazy ass concept called a cold IPA and they think it's a whole new beer style uh, and it's a crisper version of a cold IPA. Now guys, I want you to just just settle down. I will tell you what this is. You're using Pilsner malt and lager yeast, but it's not an India Pale lager at all because it's a higher ABV than an IPL. They use rice and corn for this to lighten the body, but it's an IPA, which uh, just for everybody out there re- listening, IPA stands for India pale ale we're using new world hop varieties with pilsner malt we are fermenting with a lager they claim it's a crossover style and they are calling it cold ipa uh marco help because i'm i'm at a loss i'm Uh, phil there is so much fucking wrong with what you just told us about that i can't even wrap my head around it number one as you said a second ago IPA stands for India Pale Ale. Now, there are, I'm sure, lots of people that drink beer that have no freaking idea 
what ale means in that. But just sure. to clear the air, ale is a category of yeast that is top fermenting at warmer temperatures. A lager, which is a, another category of yeast, is bottom fermenting at colder temperatures. That's why it's a lager, a crisper beer. That's why they're ales, more eff not effervescent, but more esters and, and fruit characteristics because of the warm temperatures and fermenting. Crisp beer. Uh, yeah, that too. Uh, so so I, I got to tell you, like, it, it, it's either, it's, to me, I, I think I said this on our Facebook page, it's one of two things. Either the brewery that's come up with this thinks that people are goddamn stupid and can't tell the difference or know the difference between IPAs and IPLs. Which they are. Or they themselves are stupid. So, Tim, I don't, I don't disagree with you, but either they think we're stupid or they themselves are idiots and have no idea that they didn't create anything new. Jack Sabby here in Framingham, Massachusetts, is rolling around like what the fuck are you talking about because i've been brewing ipls for 10 years uh, and doing a damn great job at it Winning by the way awards all yeah. over the world they they brought, they True. put real lagers back on the map and these guys think they're creating a new beer style calling it an ipa and there's no a in it it's uh, killing it. So I, I'm looking at Nick here because we've got a video chat thing going, and he is turning shades of red. I have never seen Nick. I know you've got uh, an opinion. And we're dropping this on Nick. So Nick's kind of hearing yeah, this yeah. for the first time, and everybody knows he is our national BJCP judge, so I'm sure he's got some yeah. colorful Dr. remarks. We were, we were recording something else. It ran a little long, so we had to throw in something different. So, uh, yeah, we picked this. Nick, what do you got? I may surprise you guys. So when Marco was talking about this, something that came to mind, another controversy that happened, God, probably longer than 10 years ago, the Black IPA. Let's talk about that for a second. Black yeah, ale. Yeah, you mean an American ale, stout? Ale. <laughs> pale black. Pale black. Makes zero sense. So there, there's a precedent for this, and it's I guess that has more of an excuse because the naming convention was probably stupid, but like the beer itself was relatively new. I mean, I'm sure there's a history of really hoppy black ales that were made in the past, but with generally the American hops, that was sort of a new style, and the naming convention was ridiculous. People are calling it Cascadian Dark Ale. Black IPA, I'm sure there are others that aren't coming to mind, but there's this precedent of naming hodgepodge mess. Yeah, the, the, the contradictory terms, right? They, they make no sense. This situation is different, though. As Marco said, people have been doing IPLs forever, even before Jack Savvy. This is insane. I cannot believe this is a thing. The only thing I think of is just marketing because it makes zero sense. Again, I, I can't imagine. People are that stupid. Maybe they are. I don't know. But I feel well, like nowadays, the, the people that buy this type of beer, they're smart. They should they should know this. I I, I just I don't get it. Well, I think I I mentioned this on now we're on social media on Facebook, is another part. I, I mentioned the whole people being stupid thing, but I also mentioned that what we know in the beer world right now and how beer sales trend and how the consumer reacts. IPAs sell. IPLs don't yeah, probably not. Yeah, <laughs> not not as much anyway, right? I mean, I, there was a time where Jack Abbey, I mentioned them a little while ago, uh, was doing something that seemed different. So they they really brought light to loggers and and how great of a style that is, and they really Americanized it and, and did some really wonderful things with loggers. And you know, Hoponius Union, Mass Rising, Kiwi Rising, like these are just phenomenal uh, hoppy loggers. So they, they put them on the map again, uh, but again, you know, they, they faded off. People are going batshit crazy over IPAs and, and these big fruit bomb hoppy beers. So when they see anything that doesn't have IPA on it, people aren't going out and buying it. So I can only assume that the biggest part of this is... IPA sell, call it a cold IPA, brew it like a fucking lager. It is a lager. I don't care what you're saying. It's an IPL. But if you want to sell it, call it an IPA. If they really want to sell it, it needs to be a Kavike fermented New England cold IPA. 
That's, which is um, that's what I'm holding out for. Uh, don't forget the double dry hop. In that yes. case, it'd, it'd only be it'll only be fermented at 80 degrees. That's the cold Kvite version <laughs> exactly. instead of 95. Right. Yeah. A nice CPR. I just feel like you could take any style and just call it whatever the fuck you want for marketing purposes to sell more of it. Like it just, it's so like I could brew a uh, a German Pilsner and call it a uh, a German IPA. Why not? Who fucking cares, right? It's a German IPA. That's what it is. And now I'm going to sell more. I mean, I, it's the same thing. It's just stupid. It's just make it up terms for marketing purposes. It would be, it, I would agree with you if that's all they were doing. If they were just saying, if they were just putting it on their cans, if they were just putting it like we've got this cold IPA on our you know, brewery sign. But these guys are like putting out their press releases saying we've invented a new beer style. And it's more like, than that's one the stuff brewery that's like, together. Yeah, it's I, I just mean, stupid. Call, just call it a, a a hazy poppy lager or something like that. At least then you you covered the bases, but uh, that probably doesn't sell either. Well, I see here on their website there, they said that they're using the word cold to imply that it'll be crushable and drinkable. Unlike, unlike, ABV. <laughs> unlike all other beers. But it's 8% ABV. There's nothing crushable about that. Well, maybe there is. Maybe you can crush the shit out of it, but you're going to crush one, maybe two. That's and, and before it crushes that, you. Uh, well, that was their excuse for not calling it an IPL. An IPL. Right? The, the yeah. all, their, their explanation for why it can't be called an IPL is because it was too high of ABV. Now, last time I checked, and I, I could be wrong, you guys tell me if I'm wrong, but we have IPAs, we have double IPAs, we have triple IPAs, we even have quadruple IPAs, not in the BJCP, we don't have those last two, but we have these other facets of IPA. I think we could also do a double IPL or a triple IPL or a fucking quadruple IPL. Like, I don't understand where these guys get off trying to convince the consumer that they're, they've created something new. These guys are not innovative. What's the brewery name? Because i got to put them on blast. What's the brewery name? Uh, it's Wayfinder Beer and oh. Ecalyptic Beer. Yeah, and e- Ecalyptic and Wayfinding Beer, you guys are frauds. I'm just telling you right now, you're full of shit. You have not created anything new. You're frauds. And if you want to be a sponsor, you can contact me. <laughs> The whole lager thing is interesting too, because I mean, it almost sounds like they don't realize that lagers can be higher than five percent. I mean, that's completely untrue. Doppelbox, Baltic, I mean, Baltic porters. Baltic porters, yeah. These are all like high ABV lagers. Like it's not. Out I of mean, the you don't you know? even have to go that far. You can just look at uh, the Fest beer served at Oktoberfest in Munich, or six and a half percent. Where are these breweries out of? Washington. Washington State. State or PC? Washington State. Oh, I feel so ashamed. I'm from Washington. Those are your people, Nick. Those uh, are your people doing this. Wait, where in Washington State? I've never heard of these breweries. Uh, do, 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 do. Are they in the Seattle area? Or? Wayfinder. Mm-hmm. Uh, Portland. Yeah, Portland, Washington. Portland, Washington. No, no, Portland, no, no, no. Yes, it is Portland, Sorry, Oregon. not Washington. Yep. Portland, Oregon. Sorry, yeah. I'm wrong. Right. Safe. Good. Fuck Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was the Washington Ouch. beer blog. So oh, come I on, Oregon's. What's wrong with Oregon, man? No, I, I love Oregon, but there's, okay, thank there's, you. There's a, there's a rivalry there. You don't understand. You know, we we usually rip on milkshake IPAs and, and pastry stouts, but uh, I never thought I'd actually rip on a lager. It's one of those things, Phil, where we we often sit here and say, like, what the hell could be next, right? So we we talk about. Right now, the biggest fad being milkshake IPAs or milkshake sours and these like wacky concoctions that aren't really beer that they pass off as beer. But so but you, does it surprise you that somebody's trying to be super innovative by recreating something that's already there and calling you their own? Like the brewed IPA thing. So Nick mentioned this on the previous episode, or he's mentioning it on an upcoming episode with one of those. Uh, <laughs> he talked about brute ipa is going away and you know at least a brute ipa was to me still a beer they were just dicking around with uh how things ate sugar to create them more dry they were just trying to uh, tweak it a little bit to make it interesting it didn't work it was you know pretty terrible but at least they were still making beer these guys are just 
like I said, they're frauds. They're they're out of their mind frauds. Playing devil's advocate somewhat, but not like standing up for cold IPAs or anything. But, you know, with the number of breweries that are out there, I mean, I went to uh, our local craft brew store the other day with the, just kind of stocking up on some beers. And I, I think I walked away with three cases of every single beer was different, uh, three cases. And the refrigerators are just so like all over the place. Like, how do you find a way to stand out? And I can see where there's, you know, competition to find some way to bump yourself out as a, as a brewery. And so I don't, I don't blame them for uh, being, you know, trying to find a way to market and, and, and stand out, but uh, not at the expense of, I guess, just pulling the wool over people's eyes and stuff and making shit up. I don't know. Tim, I can't wait to go into Craft Beer Cellar and get a cold IPA sitting on the warm shelf. That's what I, <laughs> that's what I can't wait. To, yes, to you're right. Exactly. That'll be awesome. In the sun. Right. <laughs> right in the windows. That's what I, I can't wait for. Uh, and, you know, and, and true story, though, Tim, if you uh, want to open a brewery and almost guarantee that you're going to go off in the sunset and die a slow death, put your stuff into uh, distribution and have it at, in liquor stores. Cause you'll just be lost in the sea of beers. Yeah. So tough. Yeah. I can, I can, I can relate. Well, not relate exactly, but other, other breweries aren't, they aren't pulling these kind of shenanigans. You know what I mean, so I, I, I don't know. I, there's how many breweries open the past two years, thousands of breweries and no one's come up with stupid bullshit like this, except you know, these couple breweries. I just, yeah, but Nick, yeah. It, seriously, can you, so my, this is, this is why I picked so many different beers going into that store. It's like, you know, how do I know what's maybe a standout, awesome, new, whatever, something there, there are just so many of them. Uh, how, how do you how do they float to the top and i'm not saying that, that that's the right way to go about it but there's probably a million fantastic brews out there that we have no idea of just because they're lost in the shuffle of that giant mix when you go into the store so, so my yeah. conclusion is they all taste the same so it doesn't matter unless unless it's some crazy beer all the pale ales are going to taste relatively same they're not going to have one that's going to stand out Buy local that's my recommendation because at the end of the day, these 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 breweries that are sending cans from California that have been sitting on the shelf for eight weeks in the in, in the warm sun are going to be shit compared to cans coming from your local brewery. So I, I don't mean to like harp on Tim here because Tim is interested in trying all these beers. That's awesome. I, the answer is it's it's yeah. I mean it's it's a saturated market with beers coming from all over the place. And I just I, honestly, if you if you lined up ten pale ales from breweries from from across the country, I'm, there's not going to be one that stands out. They're all going to be decent, good. Assuming they're all quality brewers. Yeah, yeah. Assuming, yeah. but even nowadays, most are. Like I, I don't know. With the, the technology and the knowledge that's out there, it's pretty rare you have a real shit brewery producing real shit beers. You know, maybe five years ago, there were some that tried to jump into mm. like, the the brewing bubble, right? Tried to take their hands at it, in, or to, you know, give it a try without really knowing how to actually run a brewery. And they produce terrible stuff nowadays. I just don't think that exists anymore. Because as Tim pointed out, the, the, it's the market's completely oversaturated, and distribution is a huge mistake nowadays. And let's give a oh, it's, it's lot terrible. of people behind you. And I guess I mean we're sort of drifting off subject here, but you know the point remains. These beers, they're all going to be, they're going to be all decent. They're going to be fine. I, I just don't think you're going to really find a standout. I think it's pretty, pretty rare nowadays. Now you will if you line up a cold IPA with a bunch of IPAs because this beer will not taste anything <laughs> like a, a regular IPA because it's not. It's an IPL. It's going to be different. Line it up with Hop Union, Mass Rising, Kiwi Rising, uh, an actual IPL. That's what it's going to taste like. And those IPLs taste different. I, I they're pretty distinct. There's yeah. definitely yeah. I mean they're they're quite different. Nick, you've got contacts out on the West Coast uh, and they distribute into. To Washington, you think you can get somebody to find us some and, and mail it back? Oh my God, please! Portland, I, I love, I love the city. Nice warm, Portland. cold IPA. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, no, I, I can't do it. Sorry. So, Marco, the the highlight I just read is they are having a virtual release party on Zoom on February twenty fifth, five thirty to six p.m., uh, which is uh, probably I don't know when this episode is going to release. I think that might be before this episode but for us recording if you got nothing better to do at 5 30 pacific time phil we should reach out to them to see if we can get beer uh so that we can participate in the zoom we'll tell them we have a podcast and we'll review it and see if they'll send it to us yeah 
<laughs> and then we'll release the show. Much to their chagrin, right? <laughs> right. This episode won't be out yet, and uh... so they won't hate us. They, they might actually sponsor us for a half a week before they uh... heard Marco go off the rails. <laughs> exactly. Oh. Yeah, we'll see what we can do. Uh, and if we fail, then uh, sorry, you won't ever hear anything more about it. Well, I, I think that does it for this uh, rant roundtable, guys. Thank you so much for taking the time to. Uh, get into it and, and it being a little off the cuff we appreciate it um, as always and we look forward to doing it with you guys again if you like what you've been hearing on our show hit that subscribe or follow button on your podcast service and if you have any ideas or feedback for us leave us a review or shoot us a dm on instagram at strike mash boil or join the conversation in our facebook group facebook.com slash groups slash m v h b c all right time again for this week's beer review each week, we're going to judge a beer submitted to us by a member of the Merrimack Valley Homebrew Club or from one of our listeners. Our guest judge is going to walk us through the judging process as if this were a homebrew competition, and all they know is the category of the beer, which this week is 34C Experimental Beer, and the base beer is 1B American Lager. Now, for beer submitted to this category, the brewer has to give us some more details. And so what he's provided is, this is a Pilsner malt uh, beer with flaked rice, carafone, melanoidin, crystal hops, and fuck me, Rice Krispie Treats. Jesus Christ. I know, hey, time out. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What? Rice say, Krispie that last, treats. say that last part one more time. Yeah, yeah. It's It's got Rice Krispie Treats in the mash. Is this like a Marco Phil troll entry? Uh, it, it must be. I don't know. Um, what is this well, thing going to look like in my fucking glass? Uh, well, <laughs> well uh, so the rest of the vital statistics, uh, OG is uh, 1061, final gravity is 1011, 14 IBUs, SRM 4.2, 6.6 ABV. <laughs> Jesus, I can't believe we're doing a Rice Krispie beer. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. It's my turn to go next, right? I'm yeah, so yeah. at a loss here that we're doing a Rice Krispie beer. And I, I think that this is legitimately just to screw with Marco. So thank you to the uh, entrant for this one. Uh, all right. But uh, joining us is uh, founder of Merrimack Valley Homebrew Club, Matt Savage, uh, who also is a BJCP certified judge. Matt, welcome back. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, listen, dude. I'm sorry that you're the one that has to experience the Rice Krispie beer. Like we should be doing this to to Nick, not not Matt. <laughs> I think Dana would enjoy it too much. So uh... yeah, this is this has Dana Oliver. Now I'm I'm gonna pour this in my glass. I'm I'm ex- I'm I'm hoping it doesn't look like like there isn't like marshmallows floating in here or just I hope it doesn't look like that. I'm just really nervous about it. Uh, but while I'm doing that, Matt, why don't you? Just kind of give us the rundown. A couple of things here, like what's the purpose of 34C? And then give us a brief description. They gave us the base style, which is 1B American Lager. So just kind of give us the rundown on those. Yep. So the the base beer would just be an American Lager, you know, Budweiser, Coors Banquet beer, that type of thing. But then this category of 34C is kind of a catch-all. Um, it's really the brewer has in mind a base beer, but then that once they add whatever they want to add to it, it doesn't really fall within a style. It's similar to category 23 that we used to have in the old uh, BJCP uh, 2008 guidelines. And that was pretty heavy in competitions before they added all these new categories, but now they still have this catch all one. So basically what the brewer has in mind is just something that they think is going to work. So judging this category is difficult because you can't judge it as a regular base style beer like they do with uh you know especially belgian style uh categories and stuff where they have a base beer but it still generally falls within those guidelines with some you know special pieces they wanted to add to it whereas this one it's basically just if it's at the judge's own perspective as they think it works or if they think it tastes good or if they even think it's you know a beer at this point i mean it's really subjective so this category is hard for the brewer as well because if you get a judge that just really hates what you did i mean it's it's difficult for them to judge it well so that's all right all right that that's interesting so uh, you're a judge sitting at a table you're reading the description you haven't looked at it you haven't smelled it you haven't done anything just based on that description you're saying that a judge could already have this uh you know determination of the beer because he just doesn't like what you did I mean, we were just crapping on it because, uh, you know, we, we've been on this this kick uh, where we, you know, have these beers that are designed not to taste like beer. Uh, and I can say if I'm looking at this beer. This looks like a beer. So this is not what I was expecting to pour in my glass. It is a crystal clear, looks like, a, you know, 
a butt heavy in my glass. But you're saying that before that, somebody reads this Rice Krispies in a beer and has this preconceived notion of like, what the fuck are you doing putting that in an American lager? You're, you're off to a bad start. Yeah, that can certainly happen. But luckily, you know, it, usually you'll have at least two people, sometimes three, uh, as a committee doing your beer. So even if one person is like, oh, this is shit, this shouldn't be a beer, you shouldn't be adding this to a beer, hopefully the more senior judge will be like, well, we at least have to give it a, a shot. Like, you know, you can't just crap on this beer before we even opened it or tasted it or anything like that. It might work. I mean, it sounds silly, but, you know, lots of beers now are silly that you get from breweries. Yeah, and I don't think we've talked about this before, uh, Phil, but a, a general rule in competition is that there's going to be like a, a – margin like an acceptable margin between judges so you know if a judge scores the beer a 35 the other judge couldn't score the beer a 19. correct yeah usually the whoever's organizing the competition would set that plus minus a lot of times it's six it can be a little bit more or less than that and there's also usually a, a minimum score that you can give 19 17 sometimes 20 it all depends on you know I guess how nice the organizer wants to be or, you know, what they decide because, you know, the person put the time in to brew the beer, pay the entry fee, want some constructive feedback. So if you give someone a 20, they're expecting a lot of feedback on what exactly happened with this beer and how can I make it better? Yeah. And for those listening, uh, the Merrimack Valley homebrew competition, our standard rules is nothing below 19. That's our lowest. And it's a five plus minus uh, margin for the judges. All right. So it, again, it's crystal clear. I can't wait to have you try this and, and talk to me about it. Uh, you know, let, why don't you kick us off with the aroma? Yep. Yeah. The aroma, I mean, I almost got like a, like a sugary, like vanilla hint to it, but it's pretty mild. There's not like a lot popping out in the aroma itself. I don't think. I don't know if it's just me. I, I see what you're saying with the sugary vanilla, but I, I, I feel like I get like a hint of soap, like a hint of dish soap. Yeah. It's almost like a, like an artificial flavoring, like, kind of aroma it's it's a little strange but i mean besides that uh yeah i mean the, yeah the soap thing i can i can see what you're saying probably safe to say we don't know this for sure but probably safe to say that the rice crispy treats that were used in this are probably like the pre-packaged processed ones i, I doubt that he like made his own yeah and homemade ones there, yeah I, I doubt that's the case and so there's a lot of stuff in rice krispie treats that's probably not um all natural organic ingredients <laughs> yeah for sure yeah. <laughs> but i mean the aroma by itself i mean i don't i'm not loving it but i don't think it's off-putting or anything like that so i'd probably be mid-level in the aroma you know, yeah because so, it's not it doesn't i don't think there are like flaws like i don't think there's anything wrong with how it fermented yeah from the aroma yeah i'd say it's, uh, it smells like a clean ferment Again, it's difficult with the rice crispies being in there and throwing off some artificial uh, type aromas and stuff. But yeah, overall, I think it's clean. I mean, the appearance on it is beautiful. I mean, it's crystal clear. Oh, yeah. The head on it was good, I thought too, with the lacing and stuff. I mean, which, which that kind of surprises me a little bit um, when people use some of these interesting adjuncts. I always expect them to have an adverse effect on the beer's ability to carbonate properly and then hold head retention. But in this case, I mean, the beer is beautiful it is a beautiful beer and the head has really great white lacing it's it looks wonderful yeah a lot of times when adjuncts like that will have an adverse effect is really when you're doing it in like the dry hop phase and stuff if you're doing it in the mash or the kettle there's at least enough time for yeast uh to drive out some of those during fermentation or you know your hot breaks and things like that or even just filtering it out while it's still hot before it's going into the fermenter if you add rice krispie treats in the fermenter i mean you this thing would be hazy as hell uh, i can <laughs> yeah I think we have some members that may have tried that before or after listening to this are going to say, hey, I wonder how I can step up the Rice Krispie beer and then send it to us to be assholes. Yeah. <laughs> On the flavor, though, I'm getting like a, a pretty aggressive burn. I don't know if it's like alcohol burn. Yeah, mm. it's pretty. I think it's pretty aggressive. Uh, you can feel it in your chest. Well, I was going to ask you about that because we've uh, I mean, six point eight. That's way too high for this for the base beer style as well. And that's what I was going to say is we've talked about this before, where we've gotten referenced beers to like say an English mild, and the beer was over seven and a half percent, and an English mild is supposed to be like three and a half. This is six 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 eight something like that. The base beer's top is supposed to be five point three. Right. 
And yeah, there's I mean, nothing to hide the alcohol behind. So I to- that was the first thing I got when I took a sip was the alcohol. Yeah, and it's almost got like a, you know, now that I'm tasting it too, I think the aroma I was getting was not vanilla, but more like marshmallow, like a, like fluff, like like they would use in like a fluff nut or sandwich or something like that. Yeah, the burn. Burn. Rice crispy yeah. beer, that's a good thing. But I mean, yeah, I think the burn really takes away from the from the drinkability of the beer too. And then with the base beer being American lager, you really want this to be crushable, you know, and it still being this, you know, the, the catch all category, you know, you can't do everything by the base, but I mean, if it's the hotness is detracting from the drinkability of the beer, I think that's a, that's a ding on the, on the beer itself. I also find it to be extremely sweet, almost sweeter. I would say sweeter than what the final gravity indicates at 10, 11, it seems way sweeter than that to me. And then like, it's, it's odd. I, I can't pinpoint it exactly, but I almost taste butter but not diacetyl butter if that makes any sense at all like it doesn't taste like diacetyl but it almost has that buttery like i think about if i was making rice krispie treats and was melting butter and marshmallows sort of that butteriness of it that sweet butter is almost what i'm getting out of it yeah i think it's it's definitely cloying and the mouthfeel is similar to when you get like a diacetyl like it's uh, you can still feel like a slickness on your tongue but i think that's the artificial like marshmallow flavor that's still just coating your mouth i don't i don't think it's diacetyl yeah uh, i don't either yeah in there but yeah i know i agree with you i think it's hot and uh, overly cloying for for my taste at least all right so then uh, overall what do you think overall impression yeah i'd probably be just because it's so hot i'd probably be at a 30 you know it's it's generally within the style i mean if it was i think it's out out of the park as far as you know the the base beer as far as uh, abv goes but i mean besides the hotness of it i don't think it's like that undrinkable if the sweetness came down a little bit and that if you took the sweetness down i think the abv would come down with it and i think it would really improve the beer now i wonder if it needs like just a touch more bitterness to help sort of balance it out a little bit well it's hard with the base beer style being so low in ibus yeah you know with the bitterness and stuff if you picked a different base beer maybe you know it would it would it could hold some of that sweetness and some of that marshmallow character a little bit better but with american lager that's really hard to do Uh, now I'll, i'll say this about the beer i'm surprised in a positive way because i was horrified of what the hell this thing was going to be when it when it came out of my uh, the glass so this would be an example of a beer that like i could drink the can of this and be okay like i don't think it's that offensive i don't think it's offensive at all not that it's that offensive i don't think it's offensive at all but this is when i talk about you know beers that aren't beers anymore this is a beer that they're using these sort of wacky adjuncts in an attempt to complement a beer versus like I'm, I don't know this for sure, but I'm going to make assumptions. I'm assuming he wasn't trying to make a beer that tasted like Rice Krispie treats. And based right. on what this looks like and and how it tastes, I'm assuming that's not what he's doing. He was trying to use it to just create some unique flavors that he thought might complement, you know, an American lager. And so that to me is an appropriate use of adjuncts, right? That's the way to do it. You got to. Uh, Because, you know, I I have no problem with adjunct beers uh, when it's complementing the beer. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, a slight hint of marshmallow or a slight hint of vanilla in an American lager, if it was very mild and didn't uh, bump up the ABV so much, I think it'd be complimentary for sure. Yeah. All right. So I think that wraps up uh, another one of our judging sessions. Again, Matt, thank you so much. Uh, You know, we had a unique one today, so I was glad that you got to do that with us. And uh, we look forward to doing this again with you. Yeah, thanks, guys. All right, so uh, joining us this week, we have a really special guest. We have the founder of Merrimack Valley Homebrew Club. Uh, we like to call him Mr. Matt Savage uh, because he started it all for us. Uh, Matt, welcome to the show. We're so excited to have you with us. Oh, thanks for having me. Sorry, I wasn't sure. Yeah, I was that was your too. Yeah. <laughs> the guy's not, like, holy crap, he's not even paying it. He's like, God, he's like, I can't believe they dragged me out to this. My bad. I'll uh, get it next time. <laughs> Since this is the first time Matt has joined us on the show, we are going to hit him with the quick fire questions from uh, that we've been doing all season long just to get to know him better. So, Matt, I'm going to give you a question. First thing that pops into your head, no long pauses or any of that, and you get one pass so since some people have been passing lately you get one he hasn't seen the list right this is totally no he's never uh, seen the list yeah, yeah, this yeah. is great perfect yeah what's your favorite beer style saison least favorite beer style oh that's tough uh tick tock pass there's your one pass all right 
Favorite beer ingredient? Uh, Pilsner malt. Least favorite beer ingredient? Lactose. Oh, boy. Like he's in the right uh, club. He's, yeah, he's yeah, you know, yeah. like obviously well, in the right place. Oh, we do have Mr. Lactose in the club. That's All true. right. What piece of brewing equipment could you never live without? pH meter. All right. What piece of uh, brewing equipment do you think is overrated? Uh, those automated digital refractometers. Oh, fuck you. No, that's, uh, I, you know what? <laughs> they don't even read properly. Anyway, we're getting distracted. Go. Uh, let's see. Where, where am I on the list? Uh, what is your dream piece of uh, brewing equipment if money is not a factor? Uh, a jacketed uh, conical. I mean, they don't even make those less than like one barrel. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Call it a All bright right. tank if you want. Yeah, sure. What beer topic subject style do you wish would go away? Milkshake IPAs. What is your desert island beer? Wow. Uh, Terrace Boba. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. I would have guessed like Anna. I mean, that would be a good one too. Yeah. That's... yeah. All right. When you aren't in the mood for a beer, what is your go-to cocktail? Uh, straight bullet bourbon. Bullet oh. straight. Okay. Listen, uh, right. you know, to steal a line from Step Brothers, did we just become best friends? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you want to do karate in the garage? <laughs> Always. Like, oh my god! Like you know, this is, you know, I, when I joined the club, I don't even know how many years ago it was. I went to my first meeting was at Mike Hands, and I knew this was the right place for me. And as my time has gone on, Matt has just validated it. Like, <laughs> well, now granted, Matt's like uh, the Jesus of our club. Which maybe he's poisoned my mind, and I'm just now a disciple of Matt Savage, and I just follow him around by listening to everything that he's taught me. That could be it, but everything he just answered there, I'm in. I'm on board. <laughs> yeah, the bullet bourbon. I, I mean, I have a bottle of bullet bourbon, but uh, I think I go through my bullet rye faster. But hey, we're in same brand bullet. Yeah, all those are good. I mean, bullet rye is the ultimate mixer. Rye. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. Uh, so Matt, I mean, I think the big thing that we want to be able to talk about is, you know, you're, you being the godfather and all of Merrimack Valley Homebrew Club, uh, we really want to be able to pick your brain on how this whole thing started. Like it's been 11 or 12 years that the club's been around. Um, and when you look back at some of the archives and, and some of the uh, OG photos, it looks like you and a couple of guys uh, that just decided let's have a homebrew club. So we want to know like what your inspiration is, what you wanted to, the reason why you wanted to start the club in the first place. And then we're going to really talk about what are the things that are really important. If somebody who is not looking to join our club or our membership is closed and they want to start their own club, what those things are that are really important to think about. Uh, but let's start at the beginning. What the hell made you want to start this club? Yeah. So uh, me and my buddy, uh, Matt McCarthy, we went to a brew on premises place in Nashua and we oh, brewed. Um, uh, Incredible brew. Yeah, Incredible brew. Yeah. Uh, I think they're closed now. Oh, are they? Yeah. Yeah, that's possible with you know current situation and stuff. Yeah. But yeah, we brewed. What did we brew? We brewed a uh, arrogant bastard clone, and then we brewed a stone IPA clone. And I was like, well, why are we driving all the way to Nashua? I could probably do this myself. I understand the whole process of what I'm doing and stuff. So we, you know, I was still living at my parents' house at the time. I think I was, I think I was 23 or something like that. So we were like, oh, well, screw it. Let's just try to put together a, a system that we can brew on and that type of thing. So we bought some kegs. Uh, I found a guy that had a plasma cutter. He cut the tops off for us. And, you know, we had our, our brew system uh, ready to go. I wasn't sure that my parents were entirely on board with it, but, you know, we racked up the turkey fryers in the driveway and stuff and started brewing beer and we started fermenting in the basement. And Wait, I was so like, Matt, but, uh, you're, that, I mean, that's, I've never heard this story before, so I haven't, I haven't actually, I don't know why I haven't heard this story, but you jumped right into a Kegel system. Like you didn't do like the Mr. B, like I'm going to start with Mr. Beer, make some shitty beer. You guys jumped right in to cutting out your own Kegels. Yeah. I've never made a, a partial mash. I've never done a, a, like a, you know, syrup beer or anything like that. Besides doing it on prem at the Nashville place, I went full in all grain from the start. Good wow. for you. Do you even know what you were doing? Uh, I mean, I th uh, looking at the time, I thought so. Looking back on it, maybe not so much. Are you did, like YouTube wasn't as big of a thing, so it's not like some of those resources were there. I mean, did you buy a book? Did you go to Homebrew Talk? 
so I bought like the John Palmer books and like, uh, you know, the homebrewers Bible, those types of things. Okay. I was reading pretty heavy on that stuff. Homebrew talk was a, a huge, uh, you know, influence on my, on my brewing, uh, back then, because, you know, you could post anything you wanted on there. You get, you know, uh, you'd get information, whether the information was good or not, you know, that's, you know, to be said, but, you know, it was helpful just to know that there was other people out there. And then when I did that, that's when I started thinking about the club. I was like, there's probably people out in this neighborhood or whatever that, you know, also want to brew. The closest homebrew club at the time was Boston and BFD way up in Manchester and then, uh, you know, foam out in Fitchburg. So I was like, there's really no homebrew club in this area. So I think it's, you know, a niche that we could probably you know, fill ourselves, you know, and just get some guys together that wanted to brew some beer and, you know, learn from each other type of thing. The way you just described it seems like a pretty quick jump from starting brewing to I want to start this club. How long were you brewing before the idea of let me get some like-minded folks together? Probably like four to six months. Wow, man. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. I mean, it's, uh, you know, and, and uh, to your point, I mean, like this, this stuff is pretty common nowadays 12 years ago 10 11 years ago whatever whatever it is not so much so it starts off with you and your buddy i'm assuming uh your friend also enjoy uh joined the club because you guys started brewing together where how did you go about finding other folks that were interested yeah it was basically all in homebrew talk uh homebrew talk had a a page where you could post that you had a homebrew club and that type of thing and I want to say that our first meet, our first meeting was at the tap up in Haverhill. I want to say it was me, my buddy Matt, and like three other guys or four other guys I'd never met before. And you know, we just all sat at a table there and chit chatted or whatever, see, you know, trying to see if we're a good fit for each other and stuff. And then it worked out, and those people were members for years after that. So I mean, it it was just all kind of happened organically. I didn't force anything. I didn't try to be, you know, anything that we weren't. It was just like a couple of guys, you know, talking about beer as time goes on, there's some momentum that's sort of carrying behind this thing and you're getting more interest and, and all of a sudden you're not four or five guys meeting up at a bar to have a few beers and talk beer. It's becoming like an organized thing. Yeah. It was crazy. I mean, I don't even under, I still don't understand how it all happened. We went from like four guys to 20, like super, super fast. All of a sudden, like everybody, you know, we had to figure out we couldn't go to bars anymore because we couldn't fit all the tables and trying to split up a check between 20 guys was like a nightmare. Yeah, no. So we started having it at, at, uh, at people's houses and stuff. And really what I think got us the most members is I had like a big cookout at my parents' house around the pool. And I just said, anybody that's interested in the club, you know, come on this day type of thing. And we ended up having like, uh, so that was Mike switch's first day. And, you know, we mm-hmm. had, I want to say probably 20, or so people with their families and stuff. And we, you know, just all kind of chatted or whatever to see if we'd get along and it worked out. And then, you know, for the most part, all those people, you know, Alec Bull, he was, he was there that day. That's, you know, some of the OG members were, were there on that, on that day. You know, again, you, you have to early on you're again, it's, it's this idea, it's this theory you're thinking about. I'm just, or n- not really organizing, but getting some folks together. And all of a sudden you got 20 people showing up to, to, you know, want to be members and want to do this regularly. Um, how does the thought process of now, again, you're automatically out of the gate as the founder leading this group. So how are you thinking about organizing it, pulling it together, making sure people understand what's going on, what to do, communicating with the community, doing all that stuff? Yeah. So my initial idea, because when we had that many people, it was difficult to kind of keep everybody on track as far as how the meeting was going to go, you know, without you know, a lot of times early on, it would just, you know, change it to like a beer share and there where there wasn't much, you know, uh, information being spread across. It wasn't that, you know, that type of thing. So the first thing that we did was a big brew day. Uh, we did it at one of the members house up in Newburyport and we bought, uh, a Jack. Was that Switzer's barrel. house? No, that was, uh, Dave Pompeo. He was the original, uh, webmaster for the yeah. website, yeah. but we bought a, uh, second use curio barrel from Allagash. And we we're like, all right, well, screw it. We're going to brew 60 something gallons of beer on this day. Imperial Damn. stout. And we're going to fill yeah. this barrel and this is going to be how we're going to get the group together. You know, everybody's going to bring their brew system. You know, it was, it was a crazy day. It, you know, we had brew systems on the back of pickup trucks that were then, you know, putting it into uh, other people's boil kettles and stuff. And lo and behold, we got, you know, 65 gallons of beer. Once it was done fermenting, we put it in the barrel for a year. And then uh, I think up until a couple of years ago, Mike Switzer still had some of that original, 
OG beer. And it came out, you know, I couldn't believe it that with that many, you know, hands in the pot type of thing that it actually came out, you know, good. And Marco, you, you, you have had that beer. Yes. Uh, yeah, he brought, Switzer uh, actually brought it. Yeah. 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 Switzer brought it to HomebrewCon and we had it at HomebrewCon in Providence right before uh, club night. Yeah. That was my, that was my original recipe. That was my original Russian Imperial style recipe. Actually, um, there's a few guys, uh, John Lynch, Alec Bull that share photos of that original mm-hmm. big brew day every once in a while. And that, uh, you know, we, we um, had a, sort of this resurgence of big brew and having it be a, a thing in the club uh, the last few years. And it's always been very reminiscent of that. We've taken inspiration from that original one uh, where we get a bunch of guys in somebody's driveway and they all bring their own systems and we're doing that same sort of thing. Yeah, I think it's really important to do that that type of stuff because it's difficult to get you know people watching you brew and that type of stuff, especially at a meeting you know where you know you're discussing you know group politics or whatever they you know the the next step is going to be on something you want to do whether it be a competition or something like that so to have that big brew day where people can bring their systems you know brew right next to somebody else that has you know five six years more experience than they do uh you know and not be afraid to ask questions that type of thing like you know there's no stupid question that you can ask you know i'm not gonna make fun of you because you don't know how to do this thing like this we're here to help you you know this is we want this beer to come out good because everybody's going to drink it if one beer comes out bad then the whole group fails uh, so I, I feel like uh, you know again I, I haven't really heard this story in depth uh, but it sounds like you guys were actually crazy ambitious with this whole thing so you start brewing you start a club at some point you get bjcp certified and all that right do you BJCP or AHA? Well, so we got AHA certified as a club, which, you know, doesn't cost anything or anything no, like that. Sure. But then I started talking to BFD, and at the time that was Rob North of Great North Brewing. Uh, he was the president up there. And, you know, I had judged uh, or helped out at his competition. He's like, you know, you should just get certified. You know, it's it's easy. You know, there's actually a test this Saturday. We have an open spot or something like that. And I was like, all right, well, I haven't studied or anything. What do you think? He's like, oh, you know, beer, you can do it. So I went out there, I took the test, got certified. And then from that point, I was like, well, now I want to do my own competition. All right, this happens in what, uh, like, what what's the period of time now? So from like a year and a half. I, Jesus, it's crazy. That's crazy. Like yeah. you go from starting the club, explosion in membership, getting BJCP certified, and now you're like, I'm gonna host my own competition. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I felt like I knew enough people in Lowell to be able to get, you know, because we didn't have any money. We didn't have many like paying members or whatever. It wasn't like it wasn't strictly enforced because I didn't want to like push people away at that point because we were so young. So I was like, you know, whoever wants to come to the meetings and stuff. The only thing is, uh, so then we got uh, in on the group grain buy from BFD. I was like, all right, well, paying members are the only ones that can get on that. You know, if anybody else wants to come, whatever, it's fine. I don't, I don't care. You know, as long as it's going to be a community that everybody's going to be comfortable with, you know, that's fine. But then we were like, you know, we want to start getting some money for the club, but also give out to uh, charity and stuff. So uh, I wanted to, to do a competition because there wasn't any competition in all of that area. The closest again, one, again, was Boston and, you know, BFD. So I knew the GM of uh, Cobblestones and Lowell. So I just, you know, floated the thing. I figured I would know, get shot down immediately. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. I was like, can you guys do food too? They're like, oh, yeah, no problem. You can have the space for free, food for free, whatever you want. And I was like, you don't want anything from me at all. Like, nope, nope, it's fine. They, this is exactly the type of thing we like. And I was like, all right, if you say so. So then I put it out there. I put it on the AHA website. Granted, so I am the only person that is organizing this competition. I didn't think to ask about, you know, drop and off spots. Had, or anything you like had that. never organized a competition before, never been involved in the organization of a comp. No. No. Okay. And we also didn't have any software for people to register. It was all by mail. Oh, shit. Holy, I can't even fathom that. So people, it was coming like FedEx, UPS. So you didn't register. even know what you had until a box of beer yeah. shows up with a piece of paper and a check? Yeah. Shut the fuck up. I can't even. <laughs> I, that is like. Poof. Now, now. Um, funny is when i joined the club i i helped out at one at the competition i don't know what year competition it was maybe the third second or third it was at cobblestones and i 
set up myself up as a guest judge and I had a bunch of beers in there and it was upstairs on the second floor and all that. But I remember by then there was already software. So I can't even, yeah. I can't even think of what it was be like. Yeah. You know, so sorry. The, the first year, uh, Dave Thomas did have, he put a thing in there that we had a number, but we had no way of taking the payment and we had no way of knowing if that, if that entry was actually going to show up. So everything was done by check or cash, but we did have an uh, entry number to link back to what we were expecting to come in. So the first competition, I think we had like 200 and something entries, and it was a complete shit show. I um, have to, it has shit. to be. <laughs> oh, my I mean, God. I, I organized the competition. I organized the judges, and I also organized all the entries because I didn't think we were going to get that many. I was like, oh, we'll get 50. It'll be, it'll be no problem or whatever. So 200 and what, two bottles each? Something like that. We three did bottles four of, bottles. Four or three bottles. bottles. Three bottles. I'm sorry. Three, three bottles. bottles. Yeah. So you had 600 bottles of beer. Yeah, in my daughter's room. She had to sleep somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Because we were in a little house at that time. I mean, I was living in Drake at the Drake time. It, and, yeah. 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 So we put them all in my daughter's room and I was trying to organize them all by style and all that stuff or whatever. <laughs> and then I had to count them all and figure out which ones we didn't actually get so I could take them off the, you know, the queue list. And then I didn't know that we were supposed to have poll sheets for judges and that type of stuff. So I just like basically just put them all on the table, like hope for the best, you know, judges were you know, the, it didn't it didn't run as smoothly as I had hoped. You know, judges were probably doing 15 beers a, a whack uh, for sessions and stuff. And I was also running the competition and judging at the same time. Damn, man. But wow. we got Holy we got crap. more more certified judges than we even needed, which was cool because BFD was like big on help. Like early on, we got a ton of help from BFD, from Foam and from uh, the Boston Warts. I mean, they sent a bunch of judges our way, which was cool. So we never really had an issue with judging necessarily is more like you know uh trying to form the uh you know the the competition together so it would you know be a cohesive thing so i'm not running around everywhere because like the food would come in i'd have to be like oh set it up here while i'm judging so it was a complete shit show the second year went a little bit more smoothly and i think progressive years went went better as well but i mean for the for the uh first competition too i literally just emailed any brewing company that i could possibly think of for sponsorship and we got more than I would have ever expected. Because so I was like, well, the, you know, fuck it. The worst thing they could say is no or right. not, yeah. not answer me. But we had we got more beer certificates. And I think more beer gave us like 150 bucks our first uh, year doing the competition. We got uh, some breweries that gave us some stuff, Sierra Nevada, you know, places like that. And then the first year, what I noticed, too, is like Stone, for instance, won't donate to anybody that's not a certified nonprofit. So I was going to try to do that, but the cost was was too high for that. So that's just something we never did with. But that was also a you know an aspiration that I wanted uh, when I was early on for the club is if we ever got to a dollar value that we could possibly do that and it made sense that would be something I could do because that opens up a lot of avenues as far as sponsorship and stuff for for the club. Yeah, we've we've run into that um, a few times. You know, not having five hundred one c three status, people being like, "Ah," because they want to write it off on their taxes and all that stuff, so it gets complicated. But the club just doesn't make enough money for it to be a worthy venture. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's it was far more expensive than I had originally thought. I was thought it was going to be like you know forming an LLC where it's like a hundred bucks or something like that. And it's not the case at all. No, I mean, they're fortunate for this one. You need a lawer to do it. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's yeah. A, that's a, it's legit. Um, right. Yeah. You know, you, you are the founder of the club. You do all this like really ambitious stuff really early on. Um, and, uh, you know, you're the president of the club for seven, eight years. Yeah. I think it was something like that. Yeah. I think it was six or seven, maybe before you guys took over. All right. It, uh, well, I mean, yeah, it was a coup. We, we <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's how it went down, but, um, it's, it's a solid seven or eight years. Um, uh, you have a bit of a change in scenery. You guys move up to New Hampshire. You know, some would say you are a traitor and decided to join BFD. <laughs> I mean, some would some would say that. Not everybody would say that, but some would. Um, but you're you're doing some different stuff now. What are you guys up to now? Before Matt answers that question, uh, we are running short on time. So we will have Matt back next week to finish that conversation and see what he's up to and what his plans are. So stay tuned for that. We also are going to be judging an Imperial Stout on that show. And Mike Switzer will be back as well as new guest Carl, where we will talk about smoking your own malt. So stay tuned for next week's show here on Strike Mash Boil.
The Strike Mash Boil podcast is produced by the Merrimack Valley Homebrew Club, an AHA sanctioned club. Follow us on Instagram at Strike Mash Boil. Join the conversation in our Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash MVHBC, or send us some feedback at Strike Mash Boil at MVHBC.com. And we're rolling. Yep. Just the joining us this week. Wait, no, I'm sorry. Time out. Yeah, we'll keep rolling. You don't uh, want to do the. To, you don't want to do the welcome to no, all that. Scroll stuff? down no. to 45. Okay, sorry. That's okay. Okay. We actually it. have this big spreadsheet thing telling us what to say. Fair if enough. You haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> I, I, well, yeah, I, I'm like a. Yeah. Anyway, this can this can be on the blooper reel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um.